Uh, good evening to everybody. I am uh, here today to introduce Dr. Jacques Vallée, uh, and it is my privilege to be able to do so. Uh, Dr. Jacques Vallée was born in 1939 in France in the midst of World War II as German bombs rained down upon his neighborhood. Vallée's first academic interest was astronomy. In 1958, when he was only 17 years old, the French Astro Astronomical Society published his report of an object seen in the sky, which was, according to Vallée, most likely a piece of the Sputnik satellite booster rocket, an impressive achievement for a young astronomer. Yet, as he writes in his journals Forbidden Science, some years before, he had seen something else. In 1954, Europe experienced a wave of UAP sightings and media coverage. Vallée's father scoffed, but the young man was intrigued. In 1955, he and his mother saw an unidentified object hovering over a church. The next day, Vallée talked to his friend who lived half a mile away and learned that his friend too had seen an object consistent with Vallée's and his mother's observations. Vallée began working for the Paris Observatory in 1961. He connected during that time with researchers, such as Amy Michel, who were interested in unidentified flying objects. However, Vallée's boss at the Paris Observatory derided efforts to conduct statistical UAP research. Vallée emigrated to the United States in 1962. That year, at the University of Texas in Austin, he helped develop the first computer-based map of Mars. He developed a working relationship with J. Allen Hynek, an astronomer at Northwestern University, who had also advised the US Air Force on various proje projects related to UFO research in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s, Project Sign, Project Grudge, and Project Blue Book. Vallée was frustrated to find, however, that the military seemed to have no real idea what was going on. Vallée went on to complete a PhD in computer science at Northwestern and began to publish books related to UAPs, such as Anatomy, Anatomy of a Phenomenon in 1965 and Challenge to Science in 1966. His 1969 book, Passport to Magonia, became a landmark work in ufology, in particular due to Vallée's articulation of the thesis that so-called UFO sightings were related to earlier ancient, medieval, and even 19th century accounts of fairies, monsters, and angels. Vallée continued to travel around the world collecting information about UAPs, which formed the basis for several more books, too numerous to name here. In the 1970s, Vallée worked with SRI International in Menlo Park, California. Some of these SRI programs involved remote viewing and telepathy. We'll hear more about them later this weekend. At this time, Vallée participated in the creation of the ARPANET, which was the precursor to the internet. The same decade, the film director Steven Spielberg made Close Encounters of the Third Kind with a character played by Francois Truffaut, which was based on Jacques Vallée. Vallée has always emphasized the need for critical thinking. He researched new UFO religious movements in the 1970s, such as the group that would became infamously known as Heaven's Gate. He has extensively documented hoaxes and media manipulation related to UFOs, such as in his book Messengers of Deception and Revelations. Vallée is careful in his assessments and warns not to jump to conclusions. Writing in his Forbidden Science journals, sooner or later, ufologists are going to fall for a new belief system that will fill the void and absolve them from the need to come to grips with real research. Vallée thus avoids easy explanation. His intent, he is intent on tracking down possible mundane explanations. For instance, he noted in an oral history with Rice University that one of the most infamous UAP events in history, which occurred in 1948 when the airplane pilot, Captain Thomas F. Mantell, chased a UFO to a high altitude before a fatal crash, could very possibly have been caused by a government balloon called Skyhook, which the pilot was not aware of. Yet. Despite such explanations, Vallée has consistently returned to data that exceeds explanations, arguing that apparently anomalous or bizarre characteristics are a core feature of the UAP phenomenon. It is this critical and creative work that makes his writing and research so intriguing. 
He has continued to publish research on computer science, UAPs, and biomedical technology, working with people such as entrepreneur Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Airspace, historian of religions Dr. Jeff Kripal at Rice University, scientist Dr. Gary Nolan at Stanford University of Medicine, and groups such as the Galileo Project at Harvard University. Jacques Vallée's donation to Rice contains many boxes worth of material. These contain in particular the materials that form the basis for his books, research gathered from around the world for several decades, including places such as Argentina and Brazil. There are witness testimonies, radar reports, a host of UFO publications written in many languages, and Dr. Vallée's correspondence with researchers such as Dr. Hynek. These papers have now been archived, but they at present will be embargoed for a few years before becoming available to researchers. The collected papers of Dr. Jacques Vallée offer insight into the life of an intriguing intellectual and scientist and an invaluable window into the global development of the UOP phenomena and computer technology. His papers were the first donation, a fantastic beginning to the archives of the impossible. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Jacques Vallée. Thank you very much, and uh, good evening. Uh, you know, you uh, came to the right place when Professor Kripal talks about radar, and I talk about Greek mythology. We are here in Houston, thanks to Jeff, to his gifted staff and students, and to the vision at the School of the Humanities of what the continuing UFO mystery means for our models of reality. This invitation to us revolves around the phenomenon in its many incarnations and guises. At the same time, the overall purpose of this project and the ambitious plan the team is developing here at RICE only use this one topic as a template for intellectual questions that are even deeper than as a springboard to their future research. Aletheia, who is a Greek goddess of truth and disclosure, would agree. Here we are trying to discuss scientific and cultural truth in a situation that has already been sanitized by a principle of authority for its own purpose and bias. Aletheia would find that amusing. If this was exclusively a presentation before scientists, we should address the history of the observations, the qualifications of witnesses, and the reality of what was reported preferably supported by truckloads of statistics. Indeed, you will find all that in the archives over the next three days. From that, we can build new interpretations of reality and find new paths. But the phenomenon, whatever it turns out to be, quickly overflows the crucibles of science. It raises larger questions. And those must be addressed head on at the beginning. Our poster says it plainly, the truth is in here. So the real issue today is not so much the unidentified or the anomalous, but the social, academic, and psychic constructs that society has erected around them to enforce veracity. That's why we're assembled here. If it was about radar and chemistry, the scientists at NASA or at the Pentagon would have solved it a long time ago. But they have failed. I happen to think that failure is the most interesting thing in science. When scientists fail at something, their first instinct is to hide be behind the nomenclature and the vocabulary. And that's exactly what happened here. Take UFOs as one example. They have now been officially diluted and renamed 
unidentified atmospheric phenomena, or UAPs, for the sake of euphemistic beautification. The Pentagon immediately came out with its own version, UAV, for vehicle. But even that leaves Harvard's Galileo project in a quandary because a cosmic object known as Oumuamua never touched our atmosphere and wasn't either a phenomenon or, as far as we know, a vehicle. And those of us who have material fragments recovered from crash sites or reliable reports of living entities associated with UFO events are left to come up with our own three-letter cryptograms. <laughs> I want us to take note of this subtle linguistic displacement invented by Washington because it elegantly blurs the reality, physical and psychological, of what good people have been reporting around the world for the last century and more and it unfairly biases future research. Again, Aletheia would find that amusing. But the real issue, again, is indeed truth herself, not simply UFOs or UAPs. I hope to show you why, and in the process, I invite you to deconstruct the very notion of truth. Truth raises two corollaries. First, truth for whom? The disclosure of truth cannot be amorphous or universal. It assumes that people will pay attention and apply critical thinking to important situations, will understand what it is that is true, and will realize why it is of value to them. If we succeed in discovering Aletheia, how do we convey her reality to our audience? At any given time, truth cannot be more specific than the people looking for her, or they miss her. You end up with useless truth. Common experience is not very encouraging here. Not only is today's public kept in a state of permanent confusion and bewilderment by the mass media to which it is exposed, but government officials with the best intentions are often equally confused. Advocates of the reality of UFOs clamor for disclosure, but disclosure is a political expediency, not a scientific concept. What makes us think that a formal statement by authority will reveal the truth when we already know how limited and biased government research in this field has been. And when we can see that a large majority of the extent data is heavily biased or irrelevant to the subject through nobody's fault. Let me use a simple anecdote to drive the point home. Please look more closely at this poster, widely used in California and elsewhere, to guard the public from catching COVID. Still a practical concern of everyday life. The poster has been on the screen since I began speaking. It was designed by the state to convey one very important fact. If you get closer than six feet away from a person who is sick with COVID, you may die. That is true. This has been stated on the door of every shop for well over a year, A and D. I need that, there we go. A and D are somewhat protected from each other and so are B and C because they follow the distance rule. At the same time, Pythagoras' theorem, <laughs> which all of us had to learn as little kids, tells us that is, if A and D are six feet apart, then A and B are only a little over four feet apart. <laughs> that is also true for B and D, and A and C, and C and D, because this is a square. 
Pythagoras was teaching this 500 years before Christ. It's the truth. <laughs> Potentially, everybody on this poster could get very sick if they follow directions. <laughs> Herein lies our first disappointment. Aletheia cannot be smarter than the people she's dealing with. <laughs> the official poster intended to tell us a very important truth for our own good, with no intention to deceive, still ends up lying to us with gross mistakes an average student wouldn't make because she would know about squares. The point may be moved here since nobody really knows how far the live virus can travel, but we can see that truth is elusive and we rarely recognize her. In the face of ignorance, she turns deadly. When we find her and try to apply her lessons, we often fail. Even the attribution to Pythagoras isn't completely adequate. Obviously, the ancient world knew about the square of the diagonal a thousand years before him, or they couldn't have built Babylon. So even this theorem is only a later restatement of the truth a thousand years later. This is a situation you will encounter again and again when dealing with UFOs and history in general. Those are the things to keep in mind before we start this conference. Much of what we know is an approximation and many of the rules are wrong. That lesson too is implied in the archives. These are two uh, clay tablets from uh, a thousand years before Pythagoras that demonstrate the Pythagoras theorem, the square, the square of the diagonal. Our second disappointment is that Aletheia, although she is the embodiment of truth, is never naked. There is no such thing as naked truth except in mortuaries. Living truth is forced to adapt to culture, language, tradition, the environment, and especially to the subject matter in which she is called upon to make a determination. There is no absolute truth. A software programmer would say that truth is never context-free. Allow me a historical reference from the 60s that also applies to the present UFO situation and to the situation of the Pentagon. In the days preceding the Vietnam War under President Kennedy, an American spokesman held a press conference in Saigon about the political situation. One journalist asked him why an American aircraft carrier had just dropped anchor in the harbor. Pretending he didn't know about it, the diplomat asked, what American carrier? Upon which the press took him to the window and pointed to the superstructures of the enormous gray ship that towered over the city. He turned back to them and calmly said, I don't see an aircraft carrier back there, gentlemen. I am not authorized to see an aircraft carrier back there. True story. He had just stated a personal interpretation that denied the truth of others, exactly as the US Air Force was under pressure to do for nearly three decades, as it dealt uncomfortably with reports of UFOs by its own pilots under Project Blue Book which has left long-term painful scars. Not only has the discussion been biased to preserve a narrow concept of life in the universe, but even the believers in UFOs have only focused on reports made after 19, 1947 with such well-publicized observations as those of Kenneth Arnold in the state of Washington and Roswell in New Mexico ignoring the large records of equally reliable but older cases preserved from the 19th century and far back in human records. 
It is this false, distorted concept of a phenomenon that these archives are challenging, along with the current mistaken idea that long secluded military sightings can be taken as the basis of a fundamental reassessment of the whole phenomenon. The archives here at the Woodson Research Center teach us that new approaches are not only possible, they are overdue and they are essential to any global understanding of the phenomenon. As we begin this work, let us remember that we are standing across the street from the stadium where President Kennedy announced that America would land on the moon within 10 years. Truth in history is not truth in religion, truth in intelligence, or even truth in mathematics. And that's why I want to speak in terms of the four garments of Aletheia. They define the lessons we can apply to the material we plan to study over the next three days. The first garment of Aletheia is religious tradition. So if we were in Hollywood in a studio, we would, she would glide from the rafters on a ray of light, uh, cue Tannhauser opening, instruction to wardrobe, she wears a long silver dress. We're here at Rice at the invitation of the Department of Religion. So it is proper to start with the notion of truth taught and transmitted in church, coven, temple, or synagogue, whether we think it flows from self-evident principles or from the higher design of a supreme being. This particular incarnation of her, as revealed or uncovered, has ruled the minds of humans for much of civilization. So did the notion that we were only one expendable race of creatures among a large and varied population created among the stars, which included angels, both good and bad, and such other entities as ghosts and jinns. In that sense, the concept of extraterrestrial intelligence came naturally along with many basic teachings in most parts of the world, teachings we have forgotten. When scientists in the 17th and 18th century became brave enough to question the dictates of religion, they did so with arguments derived from observation rather than doctrine or revelation. You will find parallels here when scientists challenge government ineptitude or church authority or even common sense about the UFO phenomenon. Here is an early example from astronomy. One of the difficult problems you find when you pay attention to the sky is to explain the movements of the planets. While the stars remain fixed, highly visible planets like Mars, Venus, and Jupiter follow remarkable trajectories, sometimes aligning themselves and often disappearing altogether no one can miss that. No power can hide it. It's a mess. If the cosmos is a product of divine design, is supposed to be perfect, then this chaotic picture demands a serious explanation. If the Earth is the center of the universe, as common experience teaches us, then the sun's movement itself needs to be explained as well as the moons, they are complex. In the Middle Ages, religious tradition came up with an elegant response to this complexity. All you had to do in order to explain the various movements in the sky was to assume that God has assigned his angels to move the celestial bodies around according to a higher plan. This is illustrated very well in this slide, where you can see two angels moving celestial bodies around, since we know that angels do exist. Their actual reality was reaffirmed by Pius XII 
in the 1950s and again in the last few years by Pope Francis, and it remains unchallenged. Then they are quite capable of moving the sun around with a special kind of mechanical cosmic crank. If angels are real and hardly cost anything, this can also go a long way towards explaining UFOs and UAPs without invoking technological innovation by any foreign nation or even by ETs. Several books are in print, in fact, already, arguing for this angelic explanation of UFOs. The next slide is a detail of the process. Not only is it exquisitely beautiful, it is as logical, as complete as any conjecture in physics, assuming that you accept the premise about angels and their powers. As you do, please remember that some angels are described in ancient writing as not as winged humanoids with long robes and wings, but as flying wheels with eyes, like a saucer with portholes. Since the 18th century, scientists have become skeptical about angels. Instead, they teach that there must be a single mysterious invisible agent they call gravity, which somehow acts on all physical bodies and makes them go around. Not only is the Earth a moving planet like all the others, they say, but its trajectory is not a perfect circle as tradition demands. It's an ellipse with ugly bumps. This goes for all the other planets as well. A different kind of truth is introduced here in contrast to the simple, beautiful truth of planetary motion taught by the church. And the truth of gravity is very weird indeed. In a vacuum, a feather falls just as fast as a 10-pound rock, as Galileo has proven. We all know what happened to him after that. Unfortunately, science has made little progress explaining how gravity actually acts on matter, while the angels and their powers have remained strongly defined for millennia. From Kepler and Galileo to Newton and Einstein, the nature of gravity has been increasingly well described and its effects predicted, but science still fails to provide the essential element that would give us control of the process. In particular, we haven't come up with an instrument that could fulfill the same function as the angel's cosmic crank. If we did, we would not need those huge expensive firecrackers that Elon Musk uses to send astronauts to the space station. We might also be able to understand UFOs. And we would have anti-gravity. As you can see, we're beginning to rise to meet our subject, to characterize its parameters, and to redefine the archives and the problem itself in much wider ways than you're likely to see on television. So where is the truth in all this? You may have noted the parallel with the vexing problem of UFO propulsion. Can we explain it with the theories we have? For example, anti-gravity again in this case. Or do we have to resort to fantastic, still unknown properties of the multiverse? Including perhaps new theories of emerging reality that physicists like John Wheeler in 1955 have proposed. Here scientists begin to speak of information constructs beyond the space and time dimensions we used in college. Within those new theories, UFOs would not be anomalous at all or unidentified. Should we still talk about propulsion? We find a similar challenge to both science and religion in another interesting astronomical story 
that I'm going to use as a link to the next section, namely the coming of the three kings to worship Christ as a newborn baby. The story told in the New Testament is beautiful. It is also fundamental as an interpretation of the transition between the ancient world and the Christian era. But as you grow up and think about it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. What is it that attracted the Magi to the manger? And how did they know they were going to contact an emissary from the sky? Again, where is the truth? An extensive scientific literature, including speculation by Carl Sagan, has tried to answer this in various ways. Maybe there was a comet about the time of year zero, but the date of the birth of Christ is not known precisely enough to line it up with any known comet. By the same token, it could have been Venus, the brightest object in the sky, night sky, other than the moon, but the argument is imprecise. In any case, how could you tell that Venus was pointing at Bethlehem rather than Rome or Athens? Why would the kings follow a particular planet which is in the sky much of the year? When I complained about that, Jeff uh, told me to calm down <laughs> and pointed out to me a possible solution in an ancient manuscript found at the Vatican, which was incredibly difficult to translate because a later scribe had reused the parchment for other writing and the language itself was very arcane. Fortunately, there was a gifted historian, actually he was a graduate student, uh, you know, um, of uh, early Christianity, Brent Landau, brave enough to tackle the task of translation. He found that the Tractatus taught that the three kings did not need to follow a star or a comet. Um, Contrary to what uh, Carl Sagan was thinking, the infant himself, a baby, within a luminous orb in the sky, had revealed to them that he was about to incarnate as the savior of the world. Once they were able to observe the orb, which you can think of as the ultimate UFO, the story says that they simply followed him to the place where he was actually born. The scene is beautiful, beautifully rendered here. The 15th century painting preserved in New York at the cloisters. Whether the story relates to the nativity or is a recycled narrative derived from the life of Mithra is debated by scholars. The Mithra interpretation is compelling in line with what is known of the region where the kings originated and its own mystical traditions. In particular, Mithra was born on December 25, like Jesus at the winter solstice. As with UFOs, here is a familiar story we may have to push back into history by hundreds or by thousands of years. We deal with fundamental truths here, not anecdotes. In similar fashion, a few writers, such as Paul Misraki in France, himself a devout Catholic, have deconstructed the 1917 miracle of Fatima as a possible instance of extraterrestrial contact. When I visited him in Paris, Mr. Misraki told me that the Vatican, when he officially consulted the Vatican, neither challenged nor approved his interpretation, but left him free to speculate. Less well known is the fact that the miracle of Fatima had been preceded two years before, 1915, by repeated apparitions of a luminous orb before four shepherds, not the same shepherds, except for eight-year-old Lucia. In this important series of preliminary incidents, rarely detailed in the literature, the orb contained a young man, a figure of light, who stepped out and taught the kids a prayer. 
The event induced them into a state of brain stupor. Again, you will find such physiological reactions in contemporary reports of UFOs if you go through the archives, the entity delivering a specific message. The familiar situation, the records collected by Whitley Strieber and also by Leslie Keane uh, may have much to teach us about this kind of process of contact and transmission in the next few days. Running through all these experiences since ancient times, we observe versions of truth that challenge not only our understanding of the world, but the methods through which we approach its teachings and learn its lessons. Now we can move faster. The second garment of Aletheia is historical truth. Wardrobe, a simple red, white, and blue outfit, and cue the marching hymn of the Republic. At the beginning of this presentation, we saw, uh, we saw that for truth to be effective, we had to be able to recognize and comprehend her. Otherwise, all we have is a nice story. This is true about UFOs, but it's true in other contexts. And those are useful if only as thought experiments. Take the important question of the reality of unicorns. Whenever people want to dismiss an unrealistic idea, they compare it to a unicorn, which is an impossible creature, as we all know, just like the bizarre entities people see aboard UFOs. Artists draw up unicorns as horses with a horn and sometimes wings. As a little pony, you probably bought your seven-year-old daughter for Christmas. I will now show you a picture I took of my wife, Janine, in discussion with our good friend, Oberon Zell, near Ukiah in Northern California, sometime in the 1970s. The third character in this picture is a full-size living unicorn named Sir Lancelot. One of a small group of such creatures that graced the fields of Northern California, among many other things, in the 1970s, and were occasionally celebrated in books and a few films that everybody has forgotten. It turns out that there are not many live unicorns left in America, but they were common in Mesopotamia in antiquity. Some students of esoteric tradition, including several nurses I know, were intrigued by persistent stories of ancient unicorns. Instead of dismissing them, they started, uh, started asking how and why you might develop such an animal knowing full well that it wasn't a product of nature. It turns out that if you take a newborn baby he-goat, you can move the pluripotent stem cells that will generate the horns as the animal grows up later and merge them very carefully in a single spot without harming him. That's where the operating room nurses came in handy. The resulting tissue will grow into a single long and powerful horn. Obviously, you could not do that with a horse or with a female goat. But such a guardian would be more useful than a, than a dog among a herd of goats somewhere near Babylon to keep the wolves at bay. Several proud animals were created in that fashion by the group, and they became quite popular. Once at a Mendocino County Fair, my friends overheard two women admiring Sir Lancelot, as one said to the other, oh yes, it's a real one, I've seen it on television. <laughs> Most people asked no questions, they just assumed that somebody had glued a plastic horn on the head of an ordinary billy goat, as any investigating geneticist would have concluded. 
since there is no such thing as a unicorn. He would add that such an animal, if it existed, could not father a baby unicorn, which is true. And therefore, it could not exist. And of course, he would be right again. And he would be right again if he said that unicorns cannot be fancy blue horses. I have quoted that actual story about true unicorns because it reads directly into the vast literature about aliens, angels, and jinns, abduction, pregnancy induced by contact with euphonauts, and other areas in which all of us have made too many summary judgments over the years based on extrapolation from physics and biology that were unwarranted and wrong. The mistakes the people at the fair were making in conversation find echoes in our scholarly debates every day. We also make serious mistakes, in my view, when we discuss injuries from UFOs as if they were only a recent phenomenon, opening that subject, which is discussed in the archives, in reports and many letters, would take too long, but I invite you to consider this slide. This event happened on 14 September 1224 near Mount Alverne in Italy, and it was carefully recorded. The monks were praying in the countryside when one of them, Brother Leo, saw a ball of light suspended above St. Francis of Assisi while he conversed with an invisible being. I am indebted to Dr. Diana Pasulka for some of the details. Quote, he heard voices which made questions and answers, and he remarked that Francis, who was prostrate, often repeated these words, who are you, O oh my God, and my dear Lord, and who am I? A worm and thy unworthy servant. He also saw him put his hand out three times into his bosom, and each time stretched it out to the flame the light disappeared, the conversation ceased. Uh, Francis of Assisi died in uh, atrocious, um, in an atrocious way uh, within two years of that. And there are some, Jeff uh, tells me that there are some uh, remains of his clothing that are kept at, in Rome. This kind of narrative bridges the gap between lights and objects that fly through the atmosphere, reports of luminous orbs at ground level, and earth lights over special spots. Here we have a ball of light and a collimated beam observed by an external witness over a man who appears in communication with it Hence, the relevance to our study, where the religious interpretation is an interesting overlay. This, to me, exemplifies the nature and purpose of the archives as they relate to human history. The third garment of Aletheia is intelligence. Wardrobe, a black body suit, in her left ear, a tiny space communicator, Q. Varez. Anyone going through the Rice archives in search of information about UFOs should, in my estimation, keep in mind that any cases dated after 1975, and certainly after 1985, must first be analyzed as potential fakes. Not necessarily hoaxes, mind you, but products of classified projects, of which there were hundreds, that play on human expectations of things in the sky in order to hide or simply disguise new experiments with secret platforms. This is true for aircraft prototypes, whose capabilities, shapes, and material composition must 
legitimately remains secret, but it also applies to biological experiments, tests of remote paralysis, special drugs, and psychic manipulation in projects reminiscent of the old MK Ultra. In such an environment, some cancelled projects never really die. This is obviously a challenge to researchers like me, like us, and to any ufologist. It is even more a challenge to researchers from the military and the intelligence community, because in spite of their special status, even they may not have the right clearance or access to the right data set in the programs whose acronyms they don't even know. Once a project goes dark, duplication runs rampant, and oversight becomes as tangled up as a game of Scrabble. A project that was initiated at SRI in the early 1970s and continued in the 1980s at SRI and also at SAIC, both contractors to the Defense Department with classified facilities is a case in point. It made remarkable progress in assessing humans' abilities to remote view reality in space and possibly also in time. The techniques developed by the project, and in part under the name Grill Flame, are humorously demonstrated by this slide, where we see a Russian officer telling a subject to concentrate on food while they go on discussing microfilm. American remote viewers watching all this for, from a nearby building correctly conclude the Russians are about to go to lunch. A good part of the archives is concerned with the process and the results of these fascinating projects in very small part from my own data, but primarily thanks to uh, Dr. Edwin May. Fortunately, much, much of the project has now been declassified, which is definitely not the case for research about UFOs, contrary to what you see on television, conducted under various levels of secrecy by various parties in a series of investigations covering at least 77 years and counting. From the point of view of scholarship, which is our topic here, this situation calls for a few observations before we move on to my conclusion. As you will see from the archives index, most of the UFO phenomenon consists in cases seen in the countryside by civilians. But those are not the cases you're shown on TV or the cases that will now be the focus of the multi-million dollar studies being deployed. As we're about to make the same glaring mistake I showed at the beginning, with a poster intended to protect us from COVID, with the best intentions for our own good. Instead of dealing with the full extent of the problem, the main focus is now on the 10% or so of the data universe that comes from the military and other government structures. Think about the Nimitz case so often replayed on TV. There are several reasons for that. Other than the thrilling display of our mighty jets chasing an elusive invader. The implied message to the public is that the phenomenon is novel and is a threat. So the main data, both biological and physical, will be classified in the future just as it was classified in the past. The cultural and spiritual issues we're discussing here will largely be sideshows, academia, window dressing. The phenomenon has been recognized and the stigma has been removed, but essential parts of the study will still be secret, not because it is a dangerous illusion anymore, but because it is now a dangerous reality. If asked, mind you, 
I would not disagree entirely with that assessment. I was consulted at the very beginning of Grill Flame at SRI before it was signed and approved by the board, and I recommended that parts of the study be classified, as they were when it was given a green light. The UAP data warehouse development I architected during the Bass project under Bigelow Aerospace was classified, and the product is a digital structure of some 200,000 cases all over the world that remains properly classified today. It spent the largest part of the budget. But the UAP situation in the future will call for a far more sophisticated approach, a cautious but comprehensive open approach. And here again, the archives can throw lights on its complexity. What has not been recognized in the fullness of the global development and impact of UFOs is that the phenomenon does not behave as a system. It is a meta-system, which makes it extremely perilous for logical reasons that have yet to be normalized. In particular, all the databases we have in their present form are the wrong tools. And I get messages on my cell phone from a very bright, uh, very bright student somewhere at MIT who says, nobody has done a database on UFOs. I'm going to do one. You know, can you send me your records? Okay. Um, <laughs> with the deployment of um, the new government projects in this field, I've counted three so far, and with their methodology relying on the traditional structures of the intelligence community that have failed in the past, as stated publicly at the Washington Cathedral a little over a month ago by the director of Central Intelligence herself, we should be very concerned. We would do well to remember what one master spy states eloquently in John Le Carré's novel, Absolute Friends, quote, in his profession, he should know that the truth, as he finds it, is always a lie. That has been true in the past, and it's likely to be even more true in the future, to go beyond the lies as the archives teach us. We must rise in abstract thought to the level of the fine structures of the phenomena itself. We must finally decide to deal with it as formally as we can. The fourth garment of Aletheia is truth in mathematics. Wardrobe, she wears faded jeans, glasses over her nose, her hair in a bun, Q Pacific 231. Finally, we come to rest in the garden of mathematics where theorems display their complete proofs, and we can at last relax in the certainty of truth. After all, one plus one is always equal to two, and the sum of all the angles in a triangle is always 180 degrees. That is reassuring. Aletheia is at home here. We have always been taught that if a certain situation could be mathematically proven, there was no more uncertainty to be discussed. Most people lead normal, productive lives without knowing that inside your computer, one plus one is equal to 10. And in astronomy, it is perfectly natural for a triangle to have three right angles. Similarly, when skeptics argue about UFOs, and say they cannot exist as material objects because they are often seen to disappear in midair as an image observed. They forget that a continuous trajectory in five-dimensional space 
would allow such maneuvers in and out of our awareness without so much as a sonic boom. As Dr. Heineck used to teach at Northwestern, there could be another universe just five minutes ahead of us. Beyond the formal definitions, however, you should know that things are not going well at all behind the wall of the mathematics department over there. Contradictions have been arising, although they are not generally taught in college. These days, if you happen to meet a mathematician at a party, you should not ask her if the truth is necessarily knowable. When you look at the archives, flexible truth is going to come with the territory. At the dawn of the 20th century, things were going well. It seemed that science was about to solve, once and for all, the totality of mathematical problems. David Hilbert taught that a consistent and complete set of axioms could be drawn up from which you could derive all of mathematics. In a famous lecture in the year 1900, he proposed a list of only 23 difficult problems that remained. A call to arms that inspired several generations of researchers, prominent among them, John Feynman. In the 1950s and 1960s, when I studied at the Sorbonne, at the feet of Bourbaki, this was still the dominant vision. The first man who pointed out that Hilbert's theory was flawed was Gödel. As early as 1931, he had opined that mathematics could not be consistent and complete at the same time. More specifically, he taught that if a system of axioms was consistent, it would prove theorems that were wrong. And therefore, it was incomplete. And if it was complete, it would prove some theorems that were true. To put it in simple terms, consider the phrase, this statement is unprovable. If it turns out to be provable, then we're proving something that is false. And if it is indeed um, unprovable, then it is true. Then escaping our set of axioms. This, in turn, means that the axioms are incomplete. Gödel had made an important point, but he'd left a door open for a decision procedure that would check if a given assertion was true or not. Alan Turing closed that door in 1936 with his proof, which was a springboard for even more radical work by a longtime IBM logician, Gregory Chaitin. Chetin showed that some mathematical truths were only true by accident and that mathematics would no longer be called an exact science but an empirical science, even an experimental science, just like physics or biology. Of course, this is a nightmare for the mathematicians of earlier generations but for us, however, it's just an exciting new domain. And that may be the domain where we meet ufology. In our correspondence, Chetin has pointed out to me that, quote, the major breakthroughs in 21st century mathematics will be information theoretic and complexity-based characterization of what is mind, what is intelligence, what is consciousness, and why life has to appear spontaneously and then evolve. In other words, the same topics we tackle when we research ufology, the stuff that is lurking inside our archives. This suggests a link with the topics we will be studying in the next three days. For example, as early as the 1950s, French philosopher Aimé Michel reached the personal conclusion that the problem of alien contact was in the realm of the unknowable 
and would remain so until humans evolved a more complex brain. Or more likely, as you look at television today, uh, humans were replaced by a creature who had one. <laughs> Yet, as it turns out, um, he was partially wrong. The realm of things it is impossible to ever know is not necessarily a feature of human limitations. Things get worse from here. Intergalactic aliens and all future AI machines are going to have the same difficulty. <coughs> Hilbert's first problem turned out to be an example of this. The number of all the integers is represented by the Hebrew letter Aleph, subscripted by zero. It's the simplest infinity you can think of. It's an infinite number called Aleph Nal or Aleph Zero. It can be shown then the number two raised to the power Aleph Zero is another number which is greater than Aleph Nal. Hilbert asked a simple question, is there an integer between these two numbers? In 1963, a Stanford mathematician named Paul Cohen answered Hilbert's question in a way that Hilbert would not have liked. He showed that you could not know if such a number existed. It's not that you're not smart enough. It's not your brain. It's not the lack of mathematical tools you have. It is simply indecidable. A superintelligent alien from an advanced civilization would be in the same situation as in a human at Stanford, and we can't even rely on natural evolution here. When I attempted to follow that up, the correspondent of mine from Los Alamos wrote to me that I should not look for implications beyond logic. Quote, I see no connection here to the existence of UFOs or the existence of God, he observed. But because I fail to see a connection, this doesn't mean that there is no connection. In the early 18th century, Monsieur de Maupertuis set out to prove the existence of God. And he ended up formulating the principle of least action, which provides the underpinnings for much of modern physics. So what should poor Aletheia do at the end of the day, if even mathematics are questionable or beyond proof. Chetin has the best advice for her and also for us, in my view. At the end of his book, Exploring Randomness, he writes, be prepared to have many false breakthroughs which don't survive the glaring light of rational scrutiny the next morning. You have to dare to imagine many false, beautiful theories before you hit on one that works. Be daring, dare to dream, have faith in the power of new ideas and hard work, get to work, dream. Thank you.